one thing I'll remember from this camp meeting is the youth minding God. Hallelujah. Amen. Now I kind of feel like I'm straggling along at the very tail end of things, and sometimes I just feel like saying ditto. But then I'm afraid if I do that, somebody think I was bringing up Rush Limbaugh and get offended. <laughs> Amen. But I do want to say thank you from my heart. I appreciate the invitation and your making us feel at home here at Stoneboro. Amen. <clears throat> this is the, if I recall right, the fourth time we've been here with you on the grounds. And... Uh, we appreciate how that God has helped and how he's worked and moved. Upon arriving here, so we were over at the register's office and I turned and looked at that board that's over there. And all those old timers that have preached and prayed and declared the herald, the gospel of holiness from this place. That's just about enough to intimidate a country church preacher. Amen. But other than that aspect of it, we felt right at home. Amen. And you've made it that way, and we appreciate that. All your hospitality, accommodations, and wonderful room provisions made for us, and your fellowship and friendship, we thank you for it. Amen. Seems to me like the farther we go along, life's pathway, the more valuable the friends and fellowship of God's holy people are to us. Amen. And we appreciate each one. We appreciate, we want to just express personal appreciation to Brother Cope, your conference uh, president and the president of this camp, and uh, <clears throat> appreciate working with, with him and the wonderful spirit that he has. Amen. And I trust you stand behind your leader, and pray for him every day, and encourage him. Amen. Every way that you can. And then Brother Common, Brother Pelton, Brother Stevens, we appreciate you, brother. Hallelujah. We feel like we've been in a four-horse harness, all pulling in the same direction. Amen. And I appreciate that so very, very deeply. Amen. Then, brother and sister Searles, last camp meeting we were in just previous to coming here, uh, brother Searles and I preached together in the camp, and uh, we were in a two-horse harness pulling in the same direction. Amen. And uh, we appreciate hearing them sing and, and the anointed ministry and song. Amen. And again, the councilmans, we thank, thank the Lord. I, I think sometimes that sanctified music is one of the foretastes of glory divine that Fanny Crosby wrote about in her hymn, Blessed Assurance. Amen. And it just touches something deep in my heart. Amen. <clears throat> thank you, cooks and kitchen workers, for the wonderful meals and all that you have done and personal kindness has showed to us. Amen. The sacrificial giving, gracious offering, more than we are worth, I'm sure. And I can assure you that every bit of it will be used for the honor and glory of God and the upbuilding of his kingdom. Amen. Praise the Lord. And now is that awful moment when I'm sure I've forgotten something or someone. And uh, <clears throat> I hope that uh, nobody goes and climbs a myth tree. Because after all, there's no room left up there after camp meeting like this. <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> so wonderful to have my uh, two children travel with me, uh, Danny and Chrissy. Amen. They've been our comrades through this last three weeks since we, uh, three weeks ago today, I believe it was, we said goodbye to my wife. Maybe it was four. I don't know. <laughs> guess maybe I've lost track. Anyhow, you're looking at one homesick preacher, I'll tell you that. 
Hallelujah. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> I've, got a, I've got a picture I keep in the front of my Bible here tonight while I'm preaching, and you can't see it, but I can. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Amen. But uh, I, do, I do appreciate our children and, and John and Ramona coming down uh, from a little ways north to join us from night to night. Hallelujah. Each one that's prayed, sought God, praised the Lord. Hallelujah. Pulled the weight in prayer. We appreciate. Amen. And we're just trusting God to help us in this, in this service here tonight. I know that he has something for us and that he wants to uh, do something that will help us when we go from this place. Amen. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> if you have your scriptures tonight and would like to follow with us in the reading, I'm asking you to just turn with me and I will try not to call more places than you have fingers to put in. <laughs> We're just going to read one verse in each place. Romans chapter 6, Matthew chapter 6, and then back in Joshua chapter 24, and Exodus chapter 32. Amen. Those who are able, would you stand with us please? Remain standing for prayer when we are done reading the Word of God. Romans chapter 6, verse 16. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey... His servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 24. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. Joshua chapter 24, verse 15. If it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve. Whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites, in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Exodus chapter 32 and the 26th verse. Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Amen. Praise the Lord. Our Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for Thy presence throughout the previous services of this camp meeting. We cannot give Thee enough praise nor offer unto Thee, Lord, enough uh, <clears throat> exaltation and, and worship to satisfy, Lord, the, the need that has been created for the same. But we want to offer Thee all of the glory and all of the honor and all of the praise. For we recognize that unto Thee it all belongs we hear the words of our precious Savior, Jesus Christ our Lord, when He said, Without me, ye can do nothing. And Lord, we realize and are very aware of it tonight. We pray that Thou would come and help us in this closing service. Stoneboro Camp Meeting 2010. We ask, Lord, that that which thou, Thine eye dost behold and Thy heart does desire for this service, that it would come to pass. We pray, O oh God, that you would order the battle. Give strength, Lord, to thy servant as we would endeavor to turn the battle to the gate. We ask that thou would give us the help of God. Lord, we pray that you would help every heart tonight. We would be enabled by the help of thy Holy Spirit, the administrations of the Blessed Comforter, to put aside from our mind, from our heart, everything that is distracting or diverting or unworthy, and attach, Lord, our attention to the vital issues that stand before us in this service tonight. May the devil not be successful in duping any soul out of the victory that has been bought for them upon the cross of Calvary. 
We ask in Jesus' name, but we ask, Lord, that thou wouldst prevail. O thou line of the tribe of Judah, in this service tonight, we pray, Lord, that you'd push back and force back, hurl back every foul, demonic, unbelieving spirit, and give glorious victory through the name of Jesus to every obedient heart. We ask in Jesus' name, unto thee will return all of the praise and glory and honor for everything that thou dost do, for only unto thee does it belong. For we ask it in the precious name of Jesus and for his precious and worthy sake. Amen. You may be seated. Now I took my breath a little bit this afternoon. I kind of inhaled suddenly when the preacher asked us to turn to 1 Kings chapter 18. (laughs) Amen. But God knows what he's doing. Yesterday afternoon, I'd felt the Lord laying on my heart to preach on the home. And before the service, the Lord took that message completely away and gave us a message on holiness. He knows all about that. Amen. Hallelujah. And then uh, this afternoon, our brother brought that wonderful message uh, concerning the home. And I'm so very thankful for it tonight. Amen. It just is an amazing thing to me how when we're workers together with God that he knows how to order the battle according to his will. Amen. But tonight I would have you to just consult whether you want to turn there or not. Very well-known words for our text. And they are found in 1 Kings chapter 18. Perhaps have been read. I think they were already in this Encampment, 1 Kings chapter 18 and verse 21, And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him, Not a word. The words of our text tonight is, How long halt ye between two opinions? And I would like to title this message tonight, I do not often do that, but I would like to title this message, A Call to the Undecided. A Call to the Undecided. The first night of this encampment, our brother preached to us from various texts upon the subjects of standing between two infinities. I don't know how many of you were here, but God surely anointed that message at the outset. And that is where the closing service of this encampment finds us tonight. I'm persuaded in my own heart that there are some that are found on the right side that at the beginning of this camp meeting were located on the wrong side of that proposition. And we thank God for everyone. But the truth tonight, I cannot express the concern that I feel in my heart and have felt throughout the afternoon. I can only just breathe it out in prayers and groans throughout the day. But I feel in my heart a concern. Perhaps it's a concern for the future of Stoneboro Camp, as our brother has mentioned. Perhaps for the Allegheny Connection. Perhaps it is for the entire holiness movement as we have known it. Perhaps it is for, far larger than that, all that stands for Bible Christianity to a lost world. But I would say to you tonight, That in the hour and the time that we're living in tonight, Jesus help us here. There is much that is left in the hands of people who are undecided. There is much responsibility that is lying upon the hearts and lives of people who are in the reality of their life at this, mo- at this very moment 
undecided. It has been impressed upon me for years, several years now, in traveling around the various places and and encountering some of God's very choicest people. It has been impressed upon me again and again that there is a little crowd who is determined to make heaven take the way of the cross, whatever it costs. Those people are not going to change their mind. They are settled. They are determined. Amen. Everything that the devil brings against them to rock them back on their heels only serves to entrench them deeper in a determination to serve God and make heaven their home. Glory be to God for every one of them. Amen. But I've also come to discover that there is also a number of people whose mind is already thoroughly made up. They're not taking the way of the cross. They're not going to strip for the race. They're not going to follow this way that radical preachers talk about and that old-fashioned holiness people testify about. Amen. Come on, friends. And that's, the, that's the facts of the case. Across our holiness churches, almost without exception, Almost every congregation, if not every, there is a number that are determined to go the way of the cross. There's a number that are determined not to. Amen. And in between that stand all the rest. They stand there. If things seem to begin to go for the uh, old-fashioned crowd and God's blessing and the fire's falling, then they'll begin to gravitate their direction and begin to think what it might mean to count the cost. Uh, But if things begin to go in the direction and the currents begin to turn in the direction uh, of other individuals who are just as determined not to take the way of the cross, uh, things begin to look that way more prosperous and and money begins to call and pleasures begin to beckon uh, and ease loving lifestyles begin to plead for their life. Uh, Amen. Come on, friends. Uh, Amen. When that begins to happen, uh, then that lukewarm, uh, sold-out crowd to the lukewarm way, uh, that's the ones that begin to carry the day as the undecideds begin to swing over onto that side. It is not just in the church that this is the case. It's the case all around the world. Amen. We're coming down into into the heated times of election cycle in our nation. And as the days close in, and as the issues begin to be defined, and people begin to stand out as the ones that are uh, candidates for this or for that or for other office, pretty soon uh, uh, there is a, uh, towards the end of the thing, there is a heated, expensive, all-out endeavor to try to win over the minds of those people who are undecided. Amen. And they say you can never tell which way they're going to go. They might go for the liberal one time and they'll go for the conservative next time and these people are the ones that take to themselves high honors and high mark for being open-minded and all of the rest of the rubbish. They're just too gutless to make a decision. Amen. Hallelujah. There are issues that are rising up, some very rapidly that we've heard of. uh, During this camp meeting, I have not listened to news since I came uh, to the campground. Uh, That's part of the fast that God puts me on during uh, during camp meeting. And uh, that during that time, I haven't heard, but someone said that there's an issue that has moved rapidly up in the courts from the state of California until it's coming right now, uh, probably going to come right into the Supreme Court because the way it's going is a fast track. Uh, amen. And, uh, and that's, uh, that's a, I'm not going to go into what it is. I haven't, I don't, not really uh, aware of the details of it. Uh, but as you think about it, you think, oh no, I wonder how it's going to go. 
There's been these issues that have come. And pe- those justices have gone off uh, on, the, on the wrong side. And then they come over and they come down on the right side. And, and there's some that are solidly conservative and, and moral in their values. There's others that you just can't. There's others that are liberal in their, and, and without uh, borders and boundaries in their morals. And it's very evident when that's the case. Uh, but there's others that are in between. Uh, and those are the ones that hold in their hands uh, the decision. And they are the undecided ones. The least worthy to make the decision are the ones that it's left in the hands of. In this crowd tonight, I'm talking to some that buried deep within your bosom by the inspiration of the Holy Ghost and through the atoning blood of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And by the grace of an almighty God, praise the Lord, there is buried deep within your bosom an unflinching determination to go through with God, whatever be the cost. Hallelujah. I'm talking to some tonight in this congregation uh, that you never have settled the issues and you're satisfied uh, to go the way of the world. Uh, Amen. You'll still stick around and be counted among the number. But I'll tell you something, friends. uh, Your pull is consistently towards the liberal and towards the worldly and towards the fleshly. Amen. But a great number, a great number will be among those who are the undecided. Let's come to our text tonight. The conditions at the time of our text. Ahab, the truth-hating, world-loving king, is ruling over Israel. And Jezebel, the earthly, sensual, devilish queen, is ruling over Ahab. Together, these two have led the people into such gross idolatry That the judgment of God has been let loose from heaven. And Elijah has walked into the king's throne room. And he has lifted up his voice with very little pomp and ceremony. And said until there is word from me, there will be no more rain in Israel. And now three and a half years have gone by. And there is drought. There is famine. Elijah comes. And he confronts Ahab. And Ahab looks at him and says, You are the troubler of Israel. And and, and Elijah says, I have not troubled Israel, but you have troubled Israel. And he calls together a meeting of all the people to a point on Mount Carmel to come to a place of decision. And when they have all gathered together and met there on top of that mountain, Elijah stands up and he confronts them with this simple question. How long halt ye between two opinions? It's going to be Baal or God. You can't serve them both. You've got to decide which one you're going to serve. You can't serve both of them. Amen. You must choose. And how long will it be until you decide? Undecided heart. I ask you tonight, how long will it be until you decide? How long will you ride the coattails of saints that are going on one by one going down the valley and their number becoming less and less? Enjoy the overflow blessings. But just about the time it's more advantageous to go with the worldly set, you'll be just as swayed by them as you are by the old time crowd when the fire's falling on them. How long will you halt between two opinions? I love you tonight. God puts that love in my heart. But I want to tell you very clearly that this is no new situation. Back in the days of Elijah, there was two classes of people that this sentence was not addressed to. How long halt ye between two opinions was not addressed to the Baal-worshipping crowd. 
It was not addressed to Ahab and, his, and the prophets of Baal. It was not addressed to Jezebel and company with all their worldly mindedness and fleshly pursuits and godless desires that they were under the control of. It was not addressed to those people. Their mind was already made up. They'd already settled it. They were going the way of the world. The question of Elijah was not addressed to those people. Amen. Jesus, help us tonight. I trust you'll pray, friends. Neither was this question addressed to those who already had settled it to follow God. How long will ye halt between two opinions was not addressed to the people who were settled to go with God. It seemed like a pretty small handful. As a matter of fact, in the context of this lesson, not very far after these words, you can find Elijah saying to God, as he's out there having run from Jezebel, you hear him saying to God, it is I and I alone that am left, and they seek my life. I'm the only one that's standing for the old ways and the old paths, and they're about to kill me, Lord, now what are we going to do? And God said, no, I've got 7,000 that have not bowed the knee to Baal, nor kissed his mouth. Amen. Glory be to God. So the question is not addressed to the Baal worshiping crowd. It is not addressed to the God worshiping crowd. But it is addressed to those who were in between sometimes one thing and sometimes another and cannot make up their mind who they are. I'm persuaded that crowd is bigger than what we want to admit. That crowd is bigger, that number is larger than what we are willing to satisfy ourselves is the truth of the matter. Amen. Amen. People don't want to be identified when it comes down to it with the lukewarm, wishy-washy, mamby-pamby, spineless, jellyfish religion that stands for the undecideds. But that's where the majority are located tonight. In Christendom, in our holiness movement. Amen. Amen. How is it in Allegheny? How is it in Stoneboro on Thursday night, August the 19th, 2010, that we may properly understand who is designated as the undecided? I would like to be particular and just name them out. I'm not going to call your name, but God the Holy Ghost will. He's very faithful to do so. And if he locates you tonight, I want to tell you, my friend, it may not be that you need a trip to the altar to blubber and bawl and boo-hoo for a half hour, 45 minutes, or three and a half hours. You probably just need to take your will in hand and for one time in your life say, I will serve the Lord. I can't answer for anybody else but everybody that walks inside of my shoes and wears my suit and puts my hat on is going to serve God. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. The very best day in your life is when you get out of that undecided column and settle it on God's side. And I'm here to tell you you can have it settled. The reason why the fire can't fall on undecided people because about the time they get squirming over towards the side of the people that have the fire and they're just about to get in the place where God's going to send the fire they look off and see something happening over there and whoa, 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 whoa and away they go and boom the fire hits right where they were an hour ago amen you can get it settled you can get it settled in your heart I'm determined I, in my own mind I'm determined that many, many times it's a simple act of the will that needs to be transacted in individuals' lives, amen, where they settle it on the basis of definite issues. I will serve the Lord. Here's the first class of the undecided, probably the largest. These are those who are among the worshipers of God, but their heart is not with them. They're among the worshipers of God, but their heart is not given to God. Would you bear with me a minute as we break this down just a little 
yield to me your attention, please, just for a few moments. I promise you, if you will, I'll not take advantage of it. But among this class are those who by early training and childhood teaching have come to learn the ways and the truth of godliness and true holiness. They understand what it means. They understand how uh, to dress and how to act. They understand what the performances of a sanctified person involves. They've learned that by watching, by learning, by teachings, by preachings, by examples. They've learned that. It's a part of them. It is a part of their lifestyle. It's, they've just been raised up that way. Uh, amen. But that poor soul uh, that has never gone beyond that and had, an imperson- had a personal encounter with God himself, uh, that is a person, my friend, who is listed among the undecided ones tonight. Amen. Thank God for early training, childhood influence and teaching. Amen. And all that's involved. But I want to tell you something. I thank God for it in my own life and all that it brought. Hallelujah. And I'm glad there was a fear of God that was put down in my heart until when the opportunities of sin and Satan began to open themselves and demonstrate their availability to my life as a young man. Amen. I found something in my heart that was very willing to take that way and go the way of the world. But there's something that rose up within my heart that was instilled in there by early training. Amen. I can't do that. I can't do that. And it began to just make me sick. Amen. Glory to God. But there had to come a day, and it came, glory to Jesus, on January the 12th, 1984. Hallelujah, bowing in a little parsonage. Uh, amen. Praise God forever. I yielded and said yes to God on the thing that he was pointing at. I said yes to him. Uh, hallelujah. On the issue that he was after. I say praise the Lord. All I told him was, Lord... If you will speak to me, I'll do whatever you say. Amen. And he spoke. Praise God. I would prayed three days. I would prayed that prayer for three days. I thought I'd crossed the deadline, Brother Cope. I thought I'd played fast and loose with God. The horror of my condition began to, uh, began to roll over, all over me. Uh, and I began to think, my God, there's no hope. Uh, and I began to pray, oh God, have mercy on my soul. God, be merciful to my soul. Amen. And that night when I knelt inside that little uh, room, shut the door behind me and got on my knees and said, oh God, if you'll just speak to me one more time. I'm sorry for all the times I said I'd do it and I didn't but if you'll speak to me one more time I promise you Lord I will obey you amen I came to my senses laying underneath the window over against the far wall but God had spoken to me praise God and I knew what he'd said he said to me if you mean that you get up and go down to the bathroom and shave off your sideburns amen that's what he said I've heard the little snivelly whinies come along and say, hey, it's okay to have my sideburns. I can have all of my wine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I used to say too. I say, you haven't talked to Jesus yet. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Glory to God. Amen. I got up from that place almost in a daze. But I said, yes, Lord. Walked out and began to head down the hallway to the bathroom. And I literally heard behind me this voice speak. Uh, Amen. This is the way. Walk ye in it. Hallelujah. And I went down to the bathroom uh, and lathered up and had myself a good holiness shave. Uh, praise God forever. Hallelujah. Some of you dudes around here could use one of them kind. Take care of them donkey feathers on your top lip. Uh, Amen. And all the rest of the shaggy broom. Come on. Amen. Praise God forever. Brother Downs used to say your poor wife, uh, when she kisses you, must feel like she fell face down on a broom. (laughs) God bless his memory. But early training, successful teaching, influencing is not a substitute for a personal surrender to Jesus Christ. Convictions come in camp meetings like this. 
in revival services where the spirit descends conviction comes to hearts and it gets a person in the grip of God until they feel like I must do something amen but if they do not yield to God the energies of that conviction will be turned against certain things here and there in their life which they will never do again and they make that their religion but they have yet to have a personal encounter with Jesus Christ amen if I'm talking to you tonight, I want to tell you there's victory for your poor soul. There are those whose conscience is alert enough to go thus far. And they will never go behind that line of conscience. There has been by the dealings and workings of the Holy Ghost, reinforced by spiritual example and the prayers of the saints. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. And line upon line, precept upon precept throughout their life, there have been lines drawn in their conscience and they'll come up to them and they'll go no farther. And because of that, they feel like I must be saved. It must be that I'm all right. But my friend, I will tell you tonight, uh, your conscience can be thus alerted and still be active uh, with the grace that teaches the heart to fear and never have passed on into that glorious realm where grace, your fears relieve. These mere hearers of the word, they hear the word. Amen. If you are one of these, you hear the word over and over and over again. But you do not do it. We heard about it this afternoon. If we're going to carry the blessings of this camp meeting, amen, beyond just the emotional influx that has been produced by it, we got to put the shoe leather of it on the dirt streets and begin to walk it. Hallelujah. Amen. Brother, sister, you'll find opportunity to do so maybe before you even get home. Be ye here, doers of the word, not hearers only deceiving your own self if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer he is likened unto a man beholding his natural face in the glass for he beholdeth himself and he goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man that he was amen the undecided tonight then there's the class of the undecided who are satisfied to avoid gross and scandalous sins. Amen. They are comfortable. Are you listening to me tonight? Amen. They're comfortable. Just so long as their feet are not ensnared in the gross crimes and the flagrant species of iniquity that walk the streets of our modern cities, flatter themselves. I've never done that. I've never done that. I've never done that. But yet, still, have no delight in the worship of God. Have no love for the secret place where it's just between you and Him. Amen. Have no attraction to the burning realities of God's holy word. There are those who desire... You hear me tonight. There are those who desire to unite the church and the world. These undecideds that think the chiefest virtue is found in the greatest open mindedness and that the highest planes of liberty upon which to walk is where the church and the world can blend together with the greatest amount of unanimity that is possible. Amen. Come on, friends. That's not what God's after tonight. That's not what he's desiring tonight. That's not what he's called us into this camp meeting for. He's not willing for us to go out of this camp meeting with that kind of a concept buried down within our hearts. But I wonder where it's found tonight. I wonder just exactly that the Holy Ghost comes down through your aisle if he won't ferret that thing out down in the deep part of your heart. Why do you carry on in the ways you carry on? 
Why do you go to the places that you go? Why are you ashamed to dress like an old-fashioned saint? Come on, friends. Amen. Why is it that you got to run with the flashy crowd? Come on, friends. Oh, God, help us tonight uh, for Jesus' sake. Why is it that your hairstyles have to positively uh, resemble the mod look that's out there in the world and that appears in the poor old duds uh, that prayed on the Hollywood screens? Amen. I ask you why it is tonight. There's so many different kinds of fads. And if you're in this service and you've never heard anything like this, you just relax. Amen. Walk in the light and mind God, you don't have a thing to worry about. Praise the Lord. Amen. But I'm talking to some that have heard it over and over and over again. You've heard it heralded and preached uh, and enforced. Uh, and you know that the people that live in those loose, slipshod, lukewarm, up and down, haphazard ways uh, and have no spiritual or moral boundaries uh, about the things that they do, have no convictions written down on the tables of their heart about the actual habits of their life. Those individuals, my friend, are not the ones that God blesses. That's right. And you know that. I know exactly what our brother was talking about. This afternoon, because I've had to sit through some of the regalia. Oh, now we're going to be blessed by such and such famous, long standing Bible school. And here comes the female portion wiggle, wiggle, waddle, waddle. Amen. One of them looks like you unwrapped their cord and plugged it straight into a 220. Amen. And their old hair goes. <laughs> Amen. If your hair goes that way naturally, that's because God made you that way. That's fine. Amen. That person, you know, their hair is just as straight as a shoestring, and they had to go and plug. What in the world did you do to get it that way, anyhow? And fr oh, it's in a bun, preacher. It's in a bun. Yeah, about 6% of it's in the bun. And 94% is waving out there in the merry little breezes, waiting for the cooties to, lie, to fly by and make a nest in it. Amen. Come on. Why are you on that, preacher? Because that's a testimony. That's a testimony that down in your heart, you identify with the undecided. It's not a marginal issue. It's not a peripheral issue. Amen. God the Holy Ghost knows how to write his law down within your heart. And as you walk in the light of it, he prays God will bless you. Praise the Lord and pour out his spirit and the fire will fall upon your life. And standing right beside the one as they're getting ready to sway him. Amen. Standing right beside the first feminine sample is feminine sample number two and she don't have the 220 straight direct current look amen she's looked like she stuck her head in a vat of mama's or grandma's hog lard and it's <laughs> amen but it follows this weird little thing you know comes down like this just leave your eyeballs sticking out. <laughs> Amen. See, that preacher doesn't matter, doesn't matter, doesn't matter. It does matter. Right. Amen. Right. I mean, it does matter. I can tell you why it matters. If I still got it in here, let me see. This is a dangerous thing to do because I probably took it out. <clears throat> I carry around sometimes, and I guess I don't have it tonight. A thing I clipped out of a Reader's Digest article. That said, this is what the fad's going to be next fall. And that's just the way they said that it was going to be. Hey, it's some little soapbox hero that doesn't know who they're married to. Amen. And's had this one's baby and that one's baby. And oh my God, help us. Amen. That person, uh, they started comb doing their hair. <laughs> Amen. Looks like their one ear is about an inch and a half higher than the other because every hair is a high tension wire. <laughs> Amen. And she comes pressing up. Praise the Lord, folks. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. Yeah, glory to God. Hallelujah. I'm glad you brought that up, brother. <laughs> Praise the Lord. God help us tonight, friends. You know these high heel things, 
You know what that's all about? That's part of the sex craze. It runs the red light district. It's what helps the prostitutes to model themselves as a good bargain. Say, I don't like that preacher. That doesn't matter. I say again, if you've never heard it, just say yes, Lord. Amen. Throw them out, walk in the light, and God will help you. Praise the Lord. But some of you have heard it before. You know it's the truth. Those big old high heels, they stand you way up and they lock up. They lock up your knees and your legs that are supposed to be able to absorb the impact of your weight as it falls upon the ground. It locks up all of those God-given uh, conditioners and it makes all the movement turn to your hips. And you go wobble and bomb, bouncing and bobbing across the street and across the campground. And everybody's supposed to say, oh, sure, there's one of God's saints. <laughs> you know that doesn't fit. Amen. Amen. Now, I'm not going to spend the whole sermon dressing down these things. But I'm going to just give you enough to illustrate so you know exactly what I'm talking about. You want to get as close to the world as you can get and still fit in the church. You are among this crowd, my friends, that call it the greatest virtue that the world and the church are the closest together so you can enjoy the benefits of each. You are a God despiser. You are among the undecided ones. And the fate, my friends, of the wholeness movement lies upon your shoulders that doesn't yet know how to make a good spiritual decision about anything. Amen. Hallelujah. I say glory to God. Praise the Lord. Amen. I love you good. I promise you I do. If I didn't, I'd just shut up and say nothing. There are those who privately seek Christ, but publicly deny him and are ashamed of him. Privately, you pray and seek God. If you can feel like you're in the cloisterment, of a confined and secure atmosphere, you are not ashamed to admit your needs and to admit the way of the cross leads home and give yourself to the propositions of the gospel to do the will of God. But when you get out amongst the world and you're facing a frowning world or one that's trying to win you over with its ways, it's an entirely different business then. Amen. You see Christ privately and deny him publicly. You are amongst this number tonight. And lastly, there's the double-minded. Perhaps it could go far enough, though I don't like to admit it, where a person who has been saved and has received a spiritual mind as the gift and grace of the Holy Comforter, but yet they have not gone on to get rid of the old carnal mind. And they've got that war going on down on the inside of their hearts. They have to, if they are willing to stay there and are passing up the opportunities of grace uh, that offer to them the, uh, the place uh, of humility and confession and dying out, glory be to God, uh, until, my friends, uh, you come up on the resurrection side uh, of God's proposition. And you fail to go through with that. You become one of the undecided. Say, no, 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 not me, not me, preacher, I'm doing everything. I no, you become one of the undecided. You're not pulling for God. You're not pulling for the world, but you're not pulling for God. Come on. You're not taking the full weight of your whole moral and spiritual influence and hurling it with all that you've got on God's side of the line. You're not doing that. Come on. Amen. God help us. I wish that I could shake alive some of you mamby-pamby pussyfooters. Amen. Hallelujah. God would like to hit you with a lightning bolt of divine fire that would burn all the self and all the worldliness out of your gizzard and fill you full of the Holy Ghost. Uh, praise God. And put you on the path of righteousness until everybody that sees you will know that you're a Christian. Everybody that sees you will know that you're a child of God. Amen. Nobody has to look at you and wonder, I wonder what that guy is. Amen. Come on, friends. Uh, there's such a thing as stripping for the race and taking the way of the cross. And that's where God's going to meet our hearts. And that's where he's going to make a personal attempt at bringing us home to heaven. And his attempts will be successful. I say glory to God. 
Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to Jesus. Oh, God help us. Friends, there's no victory your way. There's no victory going that way. You know in your heart it's not. It's a forced thing. It's a calculated thing. It's a human ingenuity that keeps you on the track that you're even on. And there's no divine influx of righteousness or peace and joy such as to comprise the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Through the Holy Ghost. You experience none of that. Amen. It's all a dark and an emptiness. And in your quiet, private, honest moments, you have to admit that. Hey, preacher, why do you know it? Because I lived there 20 years first 20 years of my life amen I'm ashamed of it I'm ashamed of it but that's where I lived hallelujah God got me out praise the Lord I'm glad he did amen but I found out it's the cross that has the glory amen we think that it doesn't matter but it does matter amen you think that it doesn't matter I remember out in the the meeting, first time we were out to Nibs there. And God got that little crowd in his grip down there in that basement place where they worshiped then. Amen. One after another, God was dealing with. And they'd just go and take care of the thing that God was. I'll tell you, God's all over the place. Hallelujah. I remember that. I'll never forget it. Amen. I remember one fella that I could reach out and almost touch tonight. Amen. God talked to him about one of his flashy ties. And he head over to the place and he came back. He said, I got rid of my flashy ties. By the way, Dad, I got rid of a couple years too. <laughs> Maybe you forgot that, but I didn't. Amen. Hallelujah. It doesn't matter, doesn't matter, doesn't matter. Little thing, little. If it's so little, why don't you get rid of it? If it's so little, why don't you turn loose? I'll tell you why. Because you have festering in your bosom that infernal sore. That's the plague of the very pits of hell. You think that it's the greatest virtue to get the world and the church as close together as they can get. And then you have the greatest opportunity to save them, you know. No, you don't. You get them that close together and the church has lost its power, its attractive power, its convicting power, its saving power, its sanctifying power. It's gone. In Michigan, her brother, Flewelling, give this illustration. In the state of Michigan, some of you will have heard it probably, but there was a pastor that's determined to have revival and he set up to have revival meeting. He couldn't find a preacher, so he just started preaching it himself. They went for a week. Nothing seemed to happen, but that pastor was determined. Amen. The church would fill up. There's a lot of people, but there was hardly any seeking. This seemed like no success. And the thing, another week they went on. Nothing happened. He said, I'm not going to give up yet. And it went on a third week. If I remember right, he went on the fourth week, if I recall correctly. And on the end of that, on Sunday night, he said, folks, maybe I was mistaken. Some words to this effect. Maybe I was mistaken in trying to have a revival meeting right now. I apologize that you have come out night after night. I thank you for your disconvenience to yourself and your schedule setting it aside. Coming honoring the, uh, the desire for God's visitation and for revival. But apparently, this is not the time that God has chosen. And so tonight, we are going to close the revival meeting with this final service. But as he made that announcement, at the end of his message, a little lady stood up, said, Pastor, can I say something? She said, I've traveled into these services to get here for every service. She said, I've traveled over miles. It's been at great expense and inconvenience. But she said, I've made it a purpose to get here night after night, herself and her children, as I recall the story. And she said in the, in the coming, she said, I've had a hunger that God would do something real in my heart and in my life. She said, I've, I've been wrestling with a little question that God, it seems, keeps bringing me back to again and again and again. I have dismissed it, that it's just a little thing and it's not going to matter. But she said, I, I, I see that I cannot dismiss it anymore. She said, God has spoken to me. 
And so I'm going to mind him, and I'm going to mind him right now. Amen. Back in those days, a lot of the ladies, for weather and for one other sake or another, they wore a little hat of some kind on their head. And they would, they would put a pins in it to hold it to their hair. And she had in that one pin that was kind of diamond studded or some kind of fanciness on the end of it. Amen. And when she said, I've determined to mind God, she reached up and got a hold of that hat pin and she drew that fancy thing out of her hair. And when she did, the power of God hit her and she fell headlong in between the benches. I'm not putting any premium on demonstration tonight. This wasn't something she or somebody else did. Amen. God did that. The power of God hit her and she fell. Amen. And she lay there and the power of God spread all through that little congregation and it broke the whole place up. Amen. And they sought at the altar till the wee hours of the morning and the revival meeting went on night after night week after week uh, for five or six weeks uh, and then when the people there were worn out it went down the road into a church of another domination uh, and it broke out there hallelujah and when it was done there after a number of weeks it went to another place and it broke out there and multiplied hundreds of people were swept into the kingdom of God by the force of that divine avalanche Uh, my God help us tonight friends Uh, what was standing in the way of all that divine tornado of tell you what it was one little thing we don't want to see it that way we want to think when God talks to us about something we have the right to decide whether we're going to do that or whether we're not brother sister I want to tell you tonight you are amongst the undecided you are the compromiser you are the wishy-washy one You are the one that does not know how to make a proper spiritual decision. But the weight of the future of perhaps Stoneboro and Allegheny, amen, and the holiness movement rests upon you and people like you. And if you don't mind God, my friends, what's going to take place, only God can tell us. Amen. You know I'm not a gloomsayer. I'm not. Amen. I believe this gospel is destined to victory. But we're going to have to obey it. It's 9 o'clock. I'm coming to a close. How long halt ye between two opinions? Are words that insist that there is a clear line of demarcation between God and Baal. I worked 20-some years in the public school system. And one of the mottos that they had was between black and and white are many shades of gray between black and white are many shades of gray oh and people would look at that motto and there's room for everybody do you know what's going on in the United States of America tonight church takeovers you can laugh and sneer and I'm not criticizing I have no idea But I observed one of Rick Warren's books in your fair book room. Someone with the authority to do so needs to go down and surgically remove it. Maybe you're ignorant of what it's about. Maybe you think it's just another little kick, you know. It's more than just a little kick. There are churches that are being literally taken over by the 40 days of purpose movement. The purpose driven life movement. If any of you preachers got that junk in your library, I would to God you pull it out and toss it in the fire. Over the past 10 years, many churches in America have been taken over by this thing and become what is called purpose-driven churches. Amen. Saddleback. And Willow Creek are the two big churches that are behind it. And they don't even call themselves churches. They're the two big organizations that are behind it. Mr. Rick Warren has determined that before such and such a year, I don't recall just now, but his plan is to send out 
what he calls one billion world Christians to eliminate the world problems. How do you like that? You say, oh my, at least some Christians militant. Hold your fire, brother. They go into a place and they've got an agenda. The agenda is one of change. They first go in. Many times it'll be with the ushering in of a new pastor. Nothing wrong with a new pastor. But many times this is when it happens. And there comes mysteriously along with them a surprising addition to the congregation that seemed very devoted to its interests. And everybody is so glad and happy. These are kind of upper crust people that seem to know the ins and outs of the thing. Praise the Lord, we're growing now. My, this is wonderful. But those are people of influence that have been highly trained by the initiative arm of Willow Creek and Saddleback. And they know what they're doing. Maybe you've never heard this. Maybe you have. If you haven't, you're going to hear it now. Pretty soon, these, by methods that they are genius at, succeed in winning their way into the place of superior influence in the church. They put themselves across until nobody wants to doubt them. They'll do what it takes to convince you that they are one of you. And you'll be amazed that people can take the way so quick. Amen. You're listening. They get that group pretty soon into the place of influence. And they begin to literally, secretly take over the government of that local body. After they have begun, they have decisive steps that they follow. They have to meet a certain program so they won't drag their feet. But they try to go no faster than the people can adapt to. But after a while, they're getting to be, wait a minute, what's going on here? And most of the time, people are not spiritually alive enough to identify it before it's too late. They get down to about the sixth step, and it's too late. The thing's gone. Amen. After, the, after they realize that they begin, they are beginning to be noticed in their takeover. They have this program for forcing their way. Number one, identify those who are resisting the changes. Then number two, assess the effectiveness of their opposition. Then number three, befriend those who are undecided befriend those who are undecided marginalize the influence of those who are determined opposition and begin to vilify those who make up their mind they're going to stay in it and fight you they're planning on you leaving and then they take it over then establish new rules that will silence all resistance. Isn't that convenient? You know what some of their marks of their takeover is? Can I read you a few? Change in music to contemporary style. Come on. Amen. And I'm not here to find fault with your fair Bible school. And I'm not here to find fault with any Bible school. Amen. We need all of them, but we don't need them half-hearted and wishy-washy and compromise them. Amen. We need them red hot and on fire and going for God with everything they got. But I want to tell you in the music programs of many of our big name Bible schools, it's contemporary, contemporary, contemporary. After a while, hymn books are removed. Special stinging stops. A big screen is put up in the front with an overhead projector so we don't have to worry about our song books anymore. So nice. The organ and the piano are by mysterious process moved out. 
And weird things are brought in. Things that you didn't even identify as musical instruments. There's repetitive singing of little one line or two line praise choruses. Praise leaders are elected. Worship leaders, praise leaders. And they begin to take a great deal of influence in the church. After a while, the trend is to dress down to casual attire. Don't dress up suit and tie to come to church. Don't dress up, you know, in your good clothes to come to church. Just come in your laid back casual stuff. Easy going. After a while, they'll even have pajama Sunday. So you can get out of bed at the last minute, get in your car, and come in your pajamas. The way you dress some of you in public, I'd hate to see you in your pajamas. Amen. Soon there's elimination of business meetings, board meetings, committee meetings. Councils and boards are done away with, and everything is being decided. There's not open and clear uh, and decisive reports on monetary and fiscal responsibilities and pretty soon everything's just in kind of a mucky murky mess and nobody knows what's going on it's the setup and brother if it hasn't come to your church looking yet it will within the next year or two those fellows are trained you better watch out for them I'm not going to read any more of that Dr. Warren stated on May 23 in 2005 at the Pew Forum on Religion and Public Life Quote, the word fundamentalist actually comes from a document in the 1920s called the Five Fundamentals of Faith. It's very, very legalistic and it's a narrow view of Christianity. The Five Fundamentals of Faith, when he was taken to task about it, that he objected to were, are you listening? He objected to the inerrancy and full authority of the Holy Scriptures. He objected to the virgin birth and deity of Jesus Christ. He objected in the Pew Forum, May 23rd, 2005. He objected upon inquiry to the fact or to the idea of the actual bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. He objected to the personal uh, atoning of Christ's blood and his vicarious death for the sins of the world. And he objected to a literal, personal, second coming of Jesus Christ. He objected to those things. Said that's a strict, legal, narrow view of Christianity. Amen. In their little agenda, towards the end of it, there's the elimination of altar calls, salvation invitations at the close of services. The words unsaved and lost Sin and hell and heaven and other gospel words are to be eliminated from the pastor's message. There's to be a reclassification of saved and lost to other terms, churched and unchurched. Examine yourself, friends. Has it got into your church? Has it got into your school? Amen. Whatever school you go to, has it got in there? Is those things being taught? Then I'll tell you, you're on your way to take over. And you better be alive and awake and aware and alert enough to identify it before it gets very far. Or you're going to find yourself out on the street wringing your hands. Say, not in our churches, preacher. That's what they all say. Amen. God help us tonight. Did you notice what it is that is going to tip the balance? The undecided. Befriend the undecided. They're the ones that are going to help you marginalize the radical crowd. Amen. And silence the opposition. And pass those rules. Amen. That will shut up everybody that speaks against. There's nothing new about that. It's been going on in the church for years. But this is the open-handed takeover. And it's centered around one man. That man happens to be a very close friend of the present president of the United States. And you better believe there's hand in glove going on behind the scenes. Amen. How about it tonight? Undecided? You need to get out of there. You need to settle it tonight. You need to meet the issues. 
that you've come up against before and said, I hope I don't have to do that. You need to meet it head on, face first, and say, yes, Lord, I will. Yes, Lord, I will. If it means cutting off a right hand figuratively, plucking out a right eye, cutting off a right foot, amen, and hurling it from you, my friend, that's the price of saving your soul from hell and your family from perdition. You better be willing to pay that price. These words mean how long halt ye between two opinions that there is a defining moment where every person decides finally who they are going to follow and they'll never turn from that not that they won't have choices to make along the way amen hallelujah but there comes a defining point eternity will show when you look back he made he settled it there glory be to God he settled it there hallelujah for this country boy preacher amen it was January the 12th 1984 when was it for you when was it for you do you remember hallelujah when hallelujah glory to God when was it for you Hey man, he's thinking about it. When was it for you? 1978. 1978. Glory be to God. When was it for you, brother? October 5th, 1990. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Amen. Now, son, the rest of you are scared to death. I'm going to come and ask you. Why are you scared? Come on. Why are you scared? I'm not trying to pin anybody down. Amen. And I don't mean that if you don't know the name, the, the exact date and time that you're unsaved, unsanctified. But brother, there's something in your life that took place. And everything before that was before Christ. And everything after that is after Christ. Hallelujah. And that stands out like the red letter day of your entire existence. Glory be to God. Amen. My good general, I wish he could have been here. Also my father-in-law. But he tells, and maybe you've heard him, how he went to the altar that night in just a little hole in his church, went to the altar and knelt down. He said he's sure when he got up that nobody thought anything happened. Because he didn't shout, he didn't run the aisles, he didn't do anything. But he said, he said a yes. He said a yes. And he got up and went away. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God forever. And I've thought about that again and again and again. Amen. We don't, we think, you know, oh my, that person got through because they shouted gloriously. Maybe, maybe not. Amen. Could be they never even got through. They came up to an issue and settled it on God's side. They're still not done, but God blessed them for obeying him. Amen. Praise the Lord. You can know. When you've got the business done, there's something real. The mark is, there's God's will and there's my will. And the only thing that matters is what happens between those two. Is it yes or is it no? Brother, that's all that matters. Is it yes or is it no? There's God's will, there's my will. When issues come up, young people, and everybody else is going, I'm so confused, I'm so confused, oh my, I'm confused, help me everybody, I'm confused, I'm confused. <laughs> Won't you pray for me, I'm confused. <sighs> we don't like these rough, rubber, rugged, radical preachers around. Keep that Stevens away. Why, he just confuses people. When they come and say to you, you get our young people in confusion. We don't like you. <laughs> Man, that makes you feel like walking away and saying, hallelujah, I'm doing something good now. <laughs> no, it doesn't. But you know how you've got to settle everything? This way. Amen. There's the will of God. What is that? Amen. There is my will. What is that? Is my will the same as God's will? If it's not, it changes right now. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise the Lord. My will will be the will of God. My will will do the will of God. My will will take the way of God. That is wholly what it takes for you to be a saved, sanctified, victorious, successful Christian. Making heaven your home and taking other people with you. 
and there's no darkness in it at all. No confusion at all. When people come whimpering and simpering and I'm confused, I'm confused. Amen. I say, turn around, brother. Amen. Boom. Go do the will of God once, will you? Amen. Hallelujah. Oh, that's terrible, isn't it? Doesn't that just give you warm fuzzies down on the inside of you? I'll tell you what will give you warm fuzzies down on the inside of you when you've settled the issue that's standing between your will and God's will and God comes down to your heart and embraces you in the eternal embraces of his everlasting love, lets you know you're his child and sweeps you up through the valleys of difficulty and carries you through, praise God, and sets you down. Said, now you walk, I'm going to walk with you. Walk before me and be thou perfect. Brother, sister, that's enough to make a Presbyterian happy. Glory be to God, I say happy. Hallelujah. I'm sorry, brother. Amen. Brother, I apologize. I didn't mean you. I get carried away sometimes. There's such a thing as getting it settled in your heart. Moving out of the undecided column and coming over into the determined, decided, deliberate, amen, hallelujah. As for me and for my house, we will serve the Lord. Glory be to God. There's nothing else that matters. God's will, my will, forever together. Praise God forever. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Glory be to God. That's victory, friend. That's victory. That's victory. Amen. You may not run and hoop and carry on, but you can know in my heart, it's God's will for me forever. Hallelujah. Amen. What about this? I don't know what about that. Oh my. Oh, that looks big. But it's God's will for me forever. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Amen. Praise the Lord. Love not the world. Neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life are not of the Father, but of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever, 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 forever. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. You got a blue song book by you there? A the forgiving spirit in my brother. He just run right to the organ. I appreciate it. Amen. Number 168. If you are a person tonight who has recognized in this service, I have been one of the undecideds, preacher, and God sees my heart. But my days of indecision are done. I make that choice firmly, finally, and fully right here. Tonight. And you're willing to declare that. Amen. Why don't you come up here and join me up here in the front. Hallelujah. Now if you're one of God's own and you've had it settled for years, I'm not talking to you. Amen. If you're some others, you know, I'm not going to do that. Then you just stay where you are. But if you've been one of the undecideds, and you've got it settled. You're going to settle it. I'm going with God. This is for you. Hallelujah. Number 168. Hallelujah. Amen.